Well, life is returning to normal, and one of the things that means is summer road trips. Last year, Americans took 300 million of them, and this year, I'm sure it will far exceed anything that, that happened last summer. Now, I don't know if road trips for you are one of those things that you were looking forward to or not. It kind of depends. Do you remember those days gone by when you and some friends were sitting around on a summer weekend and suddenly somebody said, I know, road trip. And you all piled in the car and took off for who knows where. You didn't know when you started. It, just anywhere was fine as long as you were on the road. I remember uh, a trip like that with some of my friends when I was young and and we were going to drive across Wisconsin, and, and we stopped in Amory, Wisconsin, and there was an a, a old movie theater at the time, and it was showing Disney's The Aristocats. And for some reason, we stopped, and we all piled in. We're the only ones in there. And I don't know why we did that. It just made sense at the time. And no, we weren't on drugs. But that's how road trips go. Now, of course, if you're traveling with, with toddlers, well, you don't just hit the road at the drop of a hat. No, then you, it takes planning, and it takes a, a dozen Disney videos and, and half a semi-load of stuff to travel with them. So whether you can wait, you can't wait for your next road trip, or whether you dread your next road trip, Road trips are always an adventure. And today we're going to look at three biblical road trips. Now there are a lot of trips in the Bible, but we're looking at these three because in these three trips, someone meets Jesus along the road. The first of these is a buddy trip. It's Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. I don't know, how would you like to be the one just identified as the other Mary? Mary Magdalene gets all the press. Then there's the other Mary. But that's who it is. It's Mary and Mary. And they have just been to the tomb of Jesus. And the angel has told them that Jesus is not there because he is risen. And they rush down the road to tell the other disciples what they've heard. And as they're going along, who should they meet but Jesus himself? Jesus greets them. They have an Easter experience of the risen Jesus. Matthew, he, he tells it this way. So the woman, women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. That would be so cool. To meet Jesus in the flesh. To touch him. To talk with him. Now, I've run into a lot of interesting people on, on road trips, but I have never run into Jesus in the flesh. Wouldn't that be great? But not many people have. Oh, I've run into a few people that said they've seen Jesus with their own eyes. Maybe not touched him, but at least seen him in the flesh. One woman said that during those long weeks when she was in the hospital and no one could visit, she would sometimes look over at the chair in her room and she would see Jesus there watching over her. And she would talk, talk with him. Maybe you've had an experience like that of, of seeing Jesus physically there for you. And, and if you had a, have, I, I'd, I'd love to hear that story. So look me up and share it with, with me sometime. Most people, though, don't have an Easter experience of the risen Jesus, like those two Marys had. Not to worry, though. There are other ways to meet Jesus on, on your road trips. In Acts chapter 9, 
the Apostle Paul is traveling along the road to Damascus. And at this time, he's still going by his old name, Saul. He doesn't change his name until he becomes a Christian. And in chapter 9, he's definitely not a Christian. Because he's on the road to, to Damascus to arrest and perhaps murder any Christian he encounters there. Here's how the story starts in the ninth chapter of Acts. Meanwhile, Saul was breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogue in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, that's the way of Jesus, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you'll be told what you must do. <coughs> the men traveling with Saul stood there, speechless. They heard the sound, but they didn't see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Paul meets Jesus on the road to Damascus, but he doesn't actually see him. In fact, he can't see at all. He's blinded by the light, and he can't touch Jesus like Mary did on Easter. Still, he's knocked off his feet when he hears Jesus speak to him. And his whole life, suddenly instead of, of arresting people who claim that Jesus is alive, he's telling everybody that he's met Jesus too. Do you know how the story ends? This way. In Damascus, there is a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias! Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he's seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him and restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he's done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he's come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and to their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord, <coughs> excuse me, Jesus, who appeared to you in the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples, and at once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. <coughs> Excuse me. Paul may not have seen Jesus, but he has met him. And it changed his life. <coughs> Excuse me. At our last uh, ministerial meeting for the Hastings Ministerial Association, one of the pastors there shared his story of meeting Jesus. Pastor Jim was in college, and like a number of college people, he was too cool for Jesus. He was a man of, of uh, great wisdom, he thought, all of his uh, 18, 19 years of wisdom. And he knew better than all those ignorant Christian classmates of him that there's no, 
There's no Jesus who was raised from the dead. I mean, if there was, he would need to see some proof. Not just the stories that people have told. He would need to see Jesus. <laughs> well, for some reason, he was offered a job at a, a Christian camp. And he uh, was honest about his lack of faith, but they hired him anyways. And every evening at camp, as so most Christian camps do, they have worship. And he thought it was pointless. But one night, the Spirit of Jesus fell on that camp. <coughs> there were miracles, there was healing, there was changed lives, and the one who was changed the most was Jim. And he went from poo-pooing the very idea of a living Jesus to telling everyone at camp that he has met Jesus himself. And he's been proclaiming Jesus ever since. Now you may not be able to, uh, to walk over and touch Jesus like those Marys did, but you can meet Jesus like Jim or Paul. And whether you're on a, a road trip or whether you're off to camp or whether you're, you're right here in worship this morning, you can meet Jesus in a way that knocks you off your knees, knocks you onto your knees, and has you changing your life 180. Jesus can do that, and you can meet him that way. You can have a Damascus Road experience. But again, not everybody does. Not everybody has an Easter experience of Jesus. Not everybody has a Damascus Road experience of Jesus. And if you've had one of those experiences where you've just been blinded by the light, it's changed your life in an instant. If you've had one of those experiences, I want to hear about that too. But the Bible experience to me that is the most encouraging is this last story I'm going to share with you, the story of the Ethiopian eunuch and his experience of Jesus on the desert road to Gaza. You can call it the desert road experience or the Gaza road experience. But I like to call it the normal experience. Now, at first it sounds like anything but normal because we don't castrate our government officials anymore. And this man was castrated to be a government official for the Ethiopian queen, the Candake or the Candace. We don't have those either. And we don't travel by chariot and pick up hitchhikers. So at first it seems like this is just all weird stuff. But if you put the weird stuff aside, the man's story is actually closer to many of our stories than either Paul's or Mary's. And this you find in the 8th chapter of Acts. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of the treasury of the Candake, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home he was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, Go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot, heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading, Philip asked? How can he, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as the lamb before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me please, who is the prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. 
See why I say this is a more normal experience? The man doesn't meet Jesus in the flesh. He doesn't meet him through a, a heavenly voice and a blinding flash of light. He encounters Jesus through the Bible and someone who is willing to help him. And I have a feeling that's probably closer to a lot of our experiences than the other two. That somebody took the time to help us find Jesus by sharing with us the scriptures. Now, how did, how did you come to know Jesus? Like I said, if you had one of those, those amazing experiences of seeing Jesus physically or, or a, a voice from heaven, I want to hear about that. But I would guess that, that for many of us, we were introduced to Christ by the Bible and someone who helped us to understand it, like Philip. So who was it for you? Was it your mom or dad who read Bible storybooks to you when you were a little kid? Was it a grandparent who brought you to church with them? Was it a Sunday school teacher who helped the Bible come alive to you? Or the church who gave you a Bible in the third grade? Maybe a youth group that helped you wrestle the questions of, of faith and life. Or a UEC weekend where Jesus became real for you. Maybe it was, uh, was a Bible study that opened your eyes to the Scripture. Or a friend who took the time to disciple you one-on-one. -on -one. Whatever it is. How did you come to know Jesus? And even if it wasn't your first encounter your first glimpse of Jesus, I bet somewhere along the way, somebody has been a Philip to you. Someone has helped you to grow in your knowledge of Jesus by explaining the scriptures through God's word. You've grown in your faith. And meeting Jesus that way is just as real, just as valuable, and just as life-changing as seeing him on the road to Damascus or coming from the tomb on Easter. You don't have to worry if you've never had one of those flashy experiences. Because it's not how you met Jesus on life's journey, it's that you have met Jesus and have become the child of God and have been saved. That's what matters. Not the how. God works in many different ways. But in all those ways, God draws us to himself and to knowledge of life in Jesus Christ. For most of us, there's been some way along the road, somewhere along the road where someone has taken the time to help us to know Jesus. And I thank God that there are still people like that. People like the 50 volunteers that we'll have here with Vacation Bible School coming up tomorrow. As you can see, this VBS has a train theme now, believe it or not, there are no train stories in the Bible. But the train stories in our VBS is to help the kids to learn the Bible lessons of Jesus and his power. And it just so happens that Monday's lesson, tomorrow's lesson, is Acts chapter 9. And God must really want us to get the point because months ago when I was planning out the summer sermons, I'd chosen to preach on Acts chapter 9, and I hadn't even looked at the Vacation Bible School material yet, and yet there it is. Chapter 9 today, chapter 9 tomorrow. Anytime God has to repeat something over and over again, you should pay attention. <laughs> but in Vacation Bible School, the focus is not so much on Paul who has that experience of, of hearing Jesus on the road to Damascus, but it focuses on Ananias, who God challenges to go to Paul. Remember how that went down? God tells him, hey, Paul's been praying, and I've revealed to him that somebody is going to talk to him and, and heal him, fill him with the Holy Spirit. And Ananias says, not me. Don't you know what this guy has done? His 
trip here is to arrest Christians like me. Maybe even murder. But God says, go. Because I have a plan for Paul. And he can't fulfill that plan until he experiences the grace of God and is healed and comes to have faith in me. So Ananias goes. <laughs> Remember what he says? He says, Brother Saul, Jesus, who you met on your road trip here, has sent me to you. And something like scales fall from his eyes. And he can see. And he is baptized. Just as the Ethiopian man was baptized when he encountered Jesus through the scripture. Well, let me bring this home with, with one lesson and three requests. First, the lesson. Wherever you are on life's journey, Jesus wants to meet you. And that may look differently for each of us. Maybe it's seeing him in person. Maybe it's such a, an experience like the Damascus Road experience. Or maybe it's meeting him through the scriptures and through someone who shares them with you. But however it is, all that matters is that you meet Jesus. And you can meet Jesus on the road where you're on right now. That's the lesson. Jesus wants to meet you. And he will meet you. Whatever road you're on. And now for the requests. I actually have three requests. I know sermons usually have three points and then they have one, one challenge at the end. Well, I have three challenges. One point. <laughs> and here's the first one. The first one is thank God today in your prayers for people like Philip and Ananias the people in your life who have helped you to meet Jesus and to grow in your faith. And if they're still alive, maybe even let them know this week. Give them a call. Send them a note. Text them. Let them know you were important in helping me to know Jesus and thank you. Just yesterday I wrote a, a, a card to someone who has had a, an, ex, an effect on my faith and on the faith of my family. His 100th birthday is coming up on Tuesday. And so I just let him know what an impact he's had over those 100 years and wish him a happy birthday. Do that to somebody who's had an impact on your life. Let him know that you appreciate it. So that's request number one. Request number two. Not just thank the Philips and the, the Ananiases and the Marys in your life, but be like Philip and Ananias and Mary. Help others to know the risen Jesus too. You can do that. Maybe you're volunteering at, at Vacation Bible School. Or you can do that through, through supporting your church and its ministries not only VBS and Red's Kids and the youth group and, and worship, Bible studies, all those things. Or maybe it's just a personal call to disciple somebody one-on-one, -on -one, like Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. But, but be like Philip. Help somebody else to know Jesus. Help them to understand the scriptures. And then, and then the, the third request is this. If you've met Jesus somewhere along the line, somewhere on the road of your life, but haven't yet been baptized, haven't yet committed your life to him, then talk to me or Pastor Julie. We would love to talk with you, answer any questions you have, and baptize you. Because Jesus not only wants to meet you, but Jesus wants you as a part of his family. Jesus wants you part of this family too. Well, I hope that your, uh, your family has a great summer road trip, or not, depending on if you like those kinds of things. But, but if you do go, remember that trips are always better when Jesus goes with, or where you meet Jesus along the way. So have fun, drive safe, and Christ be with you this summer on all your trips and wherever life takes you. Let's pray.
Jesus, we thank you that no matter what road we travel, and even if we travel those roads with purposes that are maybe not in line with you, you can meet us there. Jesus, we thank you for, for all the Phillips and the Marys in our lives who have, who have helped us to, to know you and to grow in, in faith, to understand your word. We pray that in some way we can be like them, that we can help others to know you, support ministries that do. Lord, there may be someone here in this room or somebody worshiping online right now that maybe just uh, encountered you for the first time today. Didn't realize how much you want them to be yours. Or maybe they've been wrestling with surrendering to you and being baptized. Lord, we pray for those right now who are, who are one step away. Lord, may they be like Paul and the eunuch, saying, what's preventing me from being baptized? And then entering into the water. Lord, this summer is going to be filled with trips, and we pray that you'll be with us on each one of them. And even if the trip is simply back home to our house, may you be there as well. We pray this in your most holy name. Amen.